Hey, all Tom Moran here from Tom's Big Spiders. Well, as many of you all know, I have a weekly podcast that's been running for, oh gosh, I think we're going on our fifth year or so, so quite some time. However, every once in a while, someone will come on and leave a comment in a video saying that they had no idea I had a podcast, or I'll mention a podcast when responding to somebody, and they'll say, I didn't know you had a podcast. So I like to do these kind of episodes every once in a while just to let folks know that it is out there, it is still going, and for folks who might be interested in it, how to get to it. So right now, we do have a website. It's Tom's Big Spiders Podcast.com that you can find it there. You can leave comments, you can upvote, whatever. You can also find it on just about any type of place that carries podcasts, Spotify, Podcaster, you name it. Amazon, we even play it sometimes on Alexa here. The kids get a kick out of it. It makes me look almost famous or something. So you can find it anywhere that you listen to podcasts. This episode here is one that I had taken notes for for quite some time, gotten away from. A lot of times what happens is I have ideas for videos, but when I get talking about them, I realize it's going to make for a really long video, so I'll do them as a podcast. This one here was one of those topics. This episode was titled, Is This Normal? And basically we focus on a handful of tarantula behaviors that keepers tend to think abnormal, but they tend to be very normal. And unlike some behaviors, even more educated tarantula keepers who have done their research may encounter these issues and be kind of freaked out by them. So normally I say enough of me talking, but you're about to hear me talk for another 50 minutes or so. So let's take a look at 11 behaviors that kind of freak tarantula keepers out, but are actually fairly common. So for today's episode, we're kind of titled, I don't know, I've been batting around titles for it. I'm going to call it, Is This Normal? Basically, what we're going to be looking at today are those situations that tend to cause keeper stress, the situations, things that spiders do or don't do that cause them stress, that make them think something is wrong, when in fact, usually it's very normal behavior. And some of these are going to be blatantly obvious to any folks who have been in the hobby for any length of time. But again, as always, I ask you, if you do know all this stuff, just think back to a time where you didn't and think back to situations where you've encountered this and you freaked out. We've all been there. I can tell you right off the bat, a lot of these, I can check these off where you sit there and go, what's wrong with my spider? Because here's what happens. We go and we do research. We do exhaustive amounts of research. We watch YouTube videos. We go hopefully on arachnoboards. We go on the world's spider catalog. We go on Facebook groups. We talk to other keepers. We get all this information in and we start to develop in our mind what is going to be a normal situation for keeping our spider. We hear this one's going to burrow. This one's going to climb. This one's going to do this. This one's going to do that. And then we get the spider and something happens. And it's like, wait a minute, I didn't read anything about this. I, I, I don't know what's happening here. Is this normal? Is this, is this a bad thing? And I think what happens is when we do experience something that we consider to be abnormal, our first thought is it's bad. It it's represents an issue with the spider. It represents an issue with our keeping. Our spider's ill. We're not keeping it correctly. You name it, it, it's a negative. So I think a lot of times as new keepers, when we encounter something that we haven't read about before, sometimes it's a situation where we have read about it before many, many, many times. And we'll get to that when we get to our like top one on here. But unfortunately, once it happens personally to us, we freak out because as much as we've read about it, this doesn't seem right. And I think some of these are misconceptions. A couple of these can be misconceptions because if you've kept other types of animals, spiders are not like a lot of the different exotic pets or definitely the furry, more normal domesticated pets that we keep. There are things behaviorally that are much, much different for them. So I think some of it's carry over from keeping other animals. A lot of it is from folks who have done their research because I hear sometimes people like, oh, do your research, do your research. Some of these things the reason why we get upset, the reason why we get freaked out about it, the reason why it causes us anxiety is because we did do our research. We know what we're supposed to be doing. We have read that this is an abora. We have read that it should be a good eater. We have read, you name it. So what we are going to do is go through some of the more popular ones, the more common ones, ones that I encounter quite a bit. And the fun thing about this is I started putting this list together a while back Got away from it a little bit. I was actually trying to go through my email and tally some of this stuff, and it just got to be too much because there's just too many emails. But as between when I started this and now, I have had questions about every single one of these. Some of them we're talking about 10 times, like 10 different people have asked me the same question about. It. So these are very common types of situations that can freak keepers out. But the good news is, under most normal circumstances, it's totally normal. So what we're going to do here is we're going to present the issue, we're going to talk about why it's normal. However, there are always exceptions, usually exceptions, we should say. Some of these are no exceptions, but almost always there are some exceptions where, you know what, you do need to pay a little closer attention to that. That is something that is alarming. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through, basically, here's the predicament, here's why it's normal, but 
what at what point should we be concerned? Because I do think sometimes we do we go the other way where we tell people, oh no, it's completely normal. We don't listen to some of the extra factors, the extra details around it. They kind of point to the fact that it may be an abnormal situation. And then we could easily miss a situation that could put the tarantula in jeopardy and that we could easily remedy because we're just going, oh, that's cool. I just talked to some people on Facebook. They all yelled at me and told me, do your research. It's normal. And I just let things go, even though there was an issue. So what we will do is we will talk about it what's normal about it, why we shouldn't be upset, and then at the end, just to make sure of each of these, we will talk about is there a point where we should be, re be concerned. So the first behavior that causes tarantula keeper stress, but is usually very normal, your tarantula has stopped eating or is fasting. Now, when I got my first two tarantulas back in the 90s, and again, it was just, I was mostly a snake guy, but I wanted two spiders. I was fascinated by them. There was a lot of information out there about the fact that many spiders would fast. It was a big deal. A lot of folks would talk about their spiders fasting. If you go back to even the, the early 2000s and even into the, well into the 2000s and go to arachnoboard read old posts, you'll see a lot of posts about people talking about different species fasting. Now, back in the day, there were fewer spiders available, I think, than we have now. And a lot of the ones we had were the quote unquote beginner species. And by that, we mean the, usually from the genera Afonopelma, Brachypelma, Gramostola. A lot of them were for Chile. You had the rose hair tarantula, probably the most popular tarantula at the time out there as far as the pet trade because they were just plucking them out of the wild. So we had a lot more issues with fasting back in the day because of the fact that many specimens that were being sold into the hobby were wild caught. And the Chilean species, I remember years ago, I tried to find this and I don't know if it's in the tarantula keeper's guide. I should probably check that. But there was a talk about the fact that their internal calendars were basically telling them a certain time a year in Chile, it would be time for them to fast because it would be colder weather. And that didn't jive for what we had up north. So what you had was a spider that was messed up with its calendar. So on times where it may be warm up here, they were fasting because of the fact that their internal clock told them this is usually a time of year we don't get food. Whatever the issue may be, I think it was a bigger deal a while back because a lot of the specimens entering the hobby, regardless of what type of species it was, were wild caught. And some of them had difficulty adjusting, new temperatures, new climates. The humidity wasn't right. All a lot of differences that would keep those spiders from settling in well. So you'd have a lot more fasting. I will say, nowadays, I don't hear as much about it. Back when I first started doing the Tom's Big Spider stuff, I got a lot more of them. My spider hasn't eaten in quite a while. And it would usually be one of those beginner species in the fauna pelmogramma. So a lot of times, the G. rosea was a popular one, obviously. H. chilensis, back in the day, very popular one that would stop eating. Fewer emails and comments about that. However, when we see it now, it's usually a situation where somebody's got a spider, it's usually somebody that's new to the hobby, they've got a spider, and they're, we, I don't like to use the term overfeeding, but they're, they have an aggressive feeding schedule, meaning a lot of people, when they get their first spiders, they're feeding these things daily. So I got somebody the other day that had a T. albopilosis that they said, I don't get it, it was eating great for two weeks, and now it isn't eating, hasn't eaten in two weeks at all. Well, I asked what the feeding schedule was. They were feeding it two or three crickets every day for two weeks. Right there is why your tarantula is fasting. A lot of species, if they are very well fed, they get to that point where their body tells them, all right, you're done. We're going to go into pre-molt. We're going to get ready to molt, get a new exoskeleton, and they stop eating. And if they fill up in a faster amount of time, meaning if in two weeks they're fed daily and they fill up quickly, you're going to have a spider that's going to spend a lot more time in pre-molt. So it's not so much fasting. It's the spider is in pre molt and it's getting its body ready and unfortunately because it ate so much that pre-molt period seems a lot longer i've seen this there's a i've seen with formictopus species i used to overfeed or feed my formictopus species a lot because i enjoyed watching them hunt and they're just little gluttons so i'd feed them feed them feed them feed them and then i would have spiders with maybe like four and a half inches and it would take like a year for them to molt they would spend so much time in pre-molt and i've heard from others who have experienced the same thing so if your tarantula is not eating it suddenly stopped eating. However, it's plump. It was eating great before that. You were feeding it a lot. You were feeding it every other day. You were feeding it once a week, but a ton of cricket, whatever it may be, it was eating well. Then your tarantula is most likely in primo. Now, at what point should you be concerned that your spider is refusing food? The big one for me, and I've seen this before, sometimes usually with uh, older adults, older females, they molted, they're thin, and they're not eating again. And obviously, any spider that molts, and especially larger, the larger the spider, the longer it takes, it takes them a while to harden up and be ready to eat again. So if you have an older spider, full grown, that just molted, you can expect, I've had ones wait over a month to actually eat again. So don't panic if it's been 
four weeks, six weeks. You know, I had situations. I remember having a, a Theraphosis stermy that took two months to eat again. We're talking about several months are going by. The spider's not eating. The spider's looking very, very thin. That's the point where there may be something to worry about. And I have it. That doesn't happen all that often. I've seen it more again with my mature mature males won't eat all that much sometimes. I've had some mature males that never eat again. I've had some that just eat here and there. They're a little more picky. But I'm, the only time I really worry about it is if there's an obviously a thin spider. The other situation is I've had people buy spiders from pet stores. And they're very, very thin because the pet stores haven't taken care of. And weeks go by, months go by, the spider's not eating. That's a point where you want to consider what's going on. So normally, I would say 95% of the time, there's nothing wrong with it. It's the spiders. Spiders doing what they do. They're not like people. We have to eat every day. Many of us, multi, multiple times a day. They can go a while without eating. So, And even if you have one of those species, the Aphonopelma gramostola, uh, Brachypelma species, and it's an adult, and it's healthy, and it takes some time off eating. I have had a few of those species take time off eating. My Brachypelma homorii did this before, where she stopped eating. I thought she was going into pre-molt. Several months went by. I tried her with a cricket. She ate again. Again, don't freak out. As long as they have access to water, and they're in good shape, and they don't seem to be stressed, not something to worry about. So for our next one, I actually, as luck would have it, had two emails that basically featured this scenario. I hear about it a lot. There's usually once a week somebody hits me up with this one. And it's something we want to get around to keepers so that they understand that this isn't something to stress about because it's a very, very normal occurrence. Basically, the scenario is this. Somebody just bought a brand new spider and they set up what they think is the perfect enclosure. They bought a beautiful acrylic enclosure for it. They've got the substrate depth right. They've got the moisture level it needs. They've got a hide. They've got some nice little plants, a little water dish. Uh, this is the perfect spider home, yet it's now been two or three days, and the spider is in a stress pose in the upper corner of the enclosure. It's it's climbing all around. It's It's definitely not settling in. And I have a lot of people that freak out about this. And sadly, what ends up happening sometimes is if they don't reach out and get somebody that, that actually is able to say, hey, listen, that's completely normal. Just wait it out. I usually do this like, oh, your spider is just settling in. And could you send me pictures of the enclosure? So that way I can check out. Sometimes there are situations where they just haven't given it the correct enclosure or they haven't given it a hide. I see it a lot with the fossorial species where they just give it a basically a bin of dirt with no starter burrow and the fossorial sitting in the corner or it's wandering all around. That's very very, very normal. Spiders take time to settle in. It's not always that you didn't set the enclosure up correctly. A lot of times what they do is first they are nervous. They're in a brand new place they've never been before. They feel exposed. So they just basically scrunch up in that little stress pose and they hide. And then what will happen is as they start to get a little more comfortable, they will start exploring. And that's where you will see spiders wandering all around the enclosure as they're trying to get the lay of the land. They're, they're It's a feeling out process. What do we got here? We have walls that I can climb. We have a burrow over here that somebody dug for me. That's really nice. We have water dish. We have spagmos. They're just, if you watch them, a lot of times when they're going around too, they're leading, leaving that little line of guide web around as they explore. And then in most situations, and it can take anywhere, I've had spiders set, settle in immediately. I've had spiders take a couple weeks. Eventually, they should pick a spot, settle down, whether it be a burrow, whether it's a fossorial species that starts uh, digging, whether it's an arboreal species that hides behind either in the cork bark round you provided or behind the cork bark round or starts webbing around the corner. You should see signs that they are settling down. So if you just picked up a spider, especially an older specimen, and rehoused it, and or even if it's one that you've had before, you've been raising it, you just did a rehousing it, it doesn't seem to be settling, don't immediately jump to the conclusion. If you've done your research, you know what this thing needs, you've watched videos, you've talked to people, don't immediately jump to the conclusion that you've done something wrong on your, your end. That's a natural behavior from a spider that's been rehoused. Now, when should it, when should you be concerned? When is it a concerning behavior? Well, if it's been months, if it's been several weeks, if it's been months down the road and your spider still isn't doing, and we're talking unsettled. We're not talking about the spider did something a little different, like it was supposed to dig, but it's webbing. We'll get to that in a moment. We're talking the spider is still wandered around or scrunched up in a corner, just looking unsettled, not eating. That's another sign sometimes that they are not settled in. That's a point where you want to take a better look at what you have provided your spider as far as 
enclosure surroundings. I've seen many instances where people, this is the most common one. Somebody will buy a sub-adult or a, a juvenile brachypelma, one of the arid species. Usually it's, you know, B. smithy, B. hammeri, uh, G. pulcropies I've seen. And they buy one of these. A GBB is another one comes up. They pick one up. They have a young adult. They set it up in an enclosure. And they're like, I don't get it. This thing will not come down to the surface. It will not touch the floor. And so I asked for pictures. And what ends up happening is somebody got it and they got the cocoa fiber. And they did the rehydration where you have to take the big bricks of cocoa fiber and rehydrate them. Of course, that leaves the cocoa fiber pretty moist and these are species that don't like moisture so what they did is they filled their enclosure with moist cocoa fiber didn't think about maybe heating it up in an oven because nobody thinks about that I didn't think about that at first until I was doing some reading I'm like oh it's a great idea they just put it in there moist they dropped the spider in yeah in that situation a you've given the spider an environment that it does not like that that's an environmental issue and this is a very common one because of the cocoa fiber so in that case I've had people go all right it's been four weeks and my spider you know here's my bee hammer eye up in the corner it will not touch the substrate that's one of those rare situations where i'd be like yes you need to work out you i wouldn't say rehouse but you need to deal with that moist substrate that's where you take it out the trick is you go to walmart or some store that sells those big turkey tins the, the, the like foil turkey pans and you put your substrate in that you put it in the oven on low heat keep the door open a little bit and just keep stirring it and dry that stuff out i one of the things i do now i just had to hydrate a bunch of cocoa fiber mixing up some of my own sub again and i basically did it on a super hot 95 degree day kind of a dry hot day and i put it out in the yard and the driveway a bit so that it would get some sun and start drying it out so that's the only situation where if it's the most common one i would say where something's not right there are other things and again if it's if it's been weeks and your spider still hasn't shown any signs of settling down, isn't eating, still stress, then it's really time to take a look at what you've set up. And that's a time where it's, I would recommend taking some pictures and approaching some keepers that you trust, whether it be a Facebook group, arachnoboards, be careful because people tend to get a little nasty if you've done something they perceive as wrong or contact somebody you know knows what they're doing and shoot them out an email and say, hey, look, this is what I set up. Is this right? Because in some cases, they'll be able to point to something and go, that's probably what your issue is. But normally, a new sp a spider being rehoused or a brand new spider being housed that doesn't settle in, that's wandering around, totally normal behavior. Now, this was one of the late additions to the list. I honestly didn't think of it until I got two emails basically in a row from folks with this issue. And then as soon as I got those emails, I started thinking back, oh man, I do get approached with this quite a bit. So the third problem that, or not quote unquote problem, the third issue that people experience with their tarantulas that make them think something's wrong, but it's probably not. In this case, it's definitely not. Their tarantula has a bald butt. And it sounds funny. But we've all been there. I remember way back in the day going to reptile conventions and seeing tarantulas and wondering why the heck the tarantula's butt was bald. And my immediate thought was somebody wasn't keeping it right. It was rubbing its butt on something. It was ripping the hair out. I thought it was such a terrible thing. Like these, And granted, they were keeping them wrong because they were on display in these 10-gallon tanks with like one inch of substrate. Hence the baldness because they were completely stressed out. They were probably wild-caught specimens that went through travel. Just very stressed out, very sad situation for tarantulas. But this is one where people get a spider and they freak out. I've had ones that order them. They ordered older specimens online. And obviously, this is only should only be with New World species. New World species have that patch of urticating bristles on their abdomens that they can kick off as a defense. What a lot of people don't know is when they're stressed or in a new environment, they will often kick those hairs off over time and spread them around the environment. It's kind of like marking their territory, so to speak. And so you can have a situation where you receive a spider that's bald. If you receive a spider that's bald, don't worry about it. The spider has just been packed up. It probably lost the rest of its hair there. It will eventually molt and get its hair back. Sometimes people have a situation where they get a spider. It's not bald. They rehouse it into its brand new enclosure. And then they notice a couple months, usually down the line, the spider's bald. And they start freaking out. What is wrong? Is the enclosure bad? Why is it bald? What's stressing it out? Why aren't I ever seeing it kick? This is totally normal behavior for new world species. When you put new world species into new enclosures, a lot of them, the first thing you'll do, they will get their bearings. As earlier we talked about, they will wander around a bit. They'll figure out where they're going to go. And then over time, they start laying some of those hairs. So by the time they molt, they, a lot of them could be quite bald. And usually what happens is now that they've settled in, once they molt, they get their hair back and they're perfectly fine unless you disturb them and get haired. The other thing is some species right before they molt, when they're in 
Pre-molt, uh, heavy pre-molt, they're getting ready to molt. They will kick down a bed of hairs as protection. Theraphosa species are infamous for this. They will put down like basically a carpet of urticating hairs. It's just staring at it will make you feel itchy. That's quite normal. So a bald, there's nothing necessarily wrong with a bald tarantula. If you receive a bald tarantula, nothing wrong with it. If you're at a show and the tarantula is bald, well, it's at a show, it's out in the open, all these people are coming by, it's been packed around. If it's at a show, it's probably been with a dealer who's gone to several shows, so this thing's moving around it's obviously been stressed out a lot of commotion movement temperature changes people watch it all that stuff very very normal and then when you get a new one home and you rehouse it or you get one that you've raised since a sling and you put it in a new home and suddenly you come back like wait a minute is this home wrong it's bald nope that's just doing what they do nothing to really be concerned about i honestly is is there a point you should be concerned i mean I don't really think so. I mean, I guess if you got one to rehouse and it's been years and it's still kicking itself bald, that's probably a spider that's not feeling very secure. But usually what happens, one rehouse, bald spider, molt again, totally fine. So not anything to worry about, not something to be concerned with, not an ailment. I've had people send me pictures. There's something wrong with my spider. There's this big nasty spot on it and they send me a picture and it's just a bald booty because it's kicked itself. Not something to worry about. So the next one. Uh, this I almost fell trapped to this one. It happens to a lot of people. I just got one the other day. Somebody sent me a photo. Could you please help me? My spider, I think my spider is dead. And they sent me a photo and it was in this position. Your spider is on its back. I've shared the story many, many times with the queen who almost didn't spend very much time with me because the first year I had her, I woke up in the morning. I opened up her enclosure because something didn't look right and she was on her back. And I'm like, oh, she's dead. I was thinking like roaches when they curl over and die on their back. The spider's dead. It was early morning. I had to go to work. So I was planning on burying her, but I said, I'll do it when I get home, got home, opened it up, and there were two spiders in there. No joke. I literally, there was a split second where I looked down and had no idea what was going on. But I share that to kind of make fun of myself, but the show can happen to anybody. Tarantula on its back is not dead. That means it is molting. So when you find a tarantula on its back, do not mess with it. Do not flip it back over. I've had a lot of instances lately of people telling me their tarantula was on its back. They freaked out. They flipped it over. Not a good situation. I had one poor person. It sounds like they probably, it, their actions resulted in the death of the spider. It sounds like it flipped over. It didn't look quite, quite right. They noticed its character was popped after they flipped it over and the spider ended up dying not being able to get out of the mold so it happens a lot and unfortunately it's it's a common mistake I get it but if your spider is on its back nothing to be concerned about enjoy the show your spider is molting the only other time you might see a spider on its back and I've seen this from people they send me pictures and I kind of get a giggle out of it it's like I don't know what's going on with my mail he's flipped upside down in his webbing and he's doing weird stuff that's the male making a sperm web. That's how they load up their sex organs with the sperm they're going to use to impregnate the females. The way they do that is they build that webbing, the sperm web, and they load that stuff up. So if you see that, enjoy the show. It's not something I've seen all that much. They try to be discreet about it. They're kind of embarrassed. You know, they don't want people watching them do that, but not something to be concerned with. So a tarantula on its back. If anything we take away from this, the folks that are just getting into the hobby, no, don't panic. Don't do anything. Don't touch it. Don't blow on it. Don't poke it. Don't pick it up with a spoon. Don't do anything. Leave it alone. It is molting. Now, when should you be concerned? I have heard cases and they're sad, like where some folks are like, I can't, I've gotten emails before. I'm so excited. My spider's on its back. It's molting. I can't wait. And I'm like, congratulations on the molt. Let me know how it goes. And then like three days later, I get an email. Is this normal? It's still on its back. That's not normal. The smaller the spider, usually the faster the molts go. Slings can be done in an hour. So I've watched slings molt very, very quickly. A couple hours, a few hours. The older the spider gets, the longer the process it is. So I've had adults. I know my LP last time. I saw her flipped over. It was, oh gosh, like 8 o'clock in the morning. I think she molted closer to... Seven o'clock in the afternoon or so. So several hours is normal for an adult. But if your spider has been on its back for days, it's time to be concerned. And unfortunately, there's not a lot you can do to help them at that point. I know I've heard folks say, well, add more moisture, spray some more. Now, at that point, it's done. Like they've already, if they're molting, they've already taken in the, hopefully the fluids they need. They're pumping fluids between the two exoskeletons to let they, um, them slip out. You can't really just add water to them at that point. I will say I've heard of weird situations, and this seems to happen quite a bit with avicularia species. The owner comes in, they find the spider on its back, they come back several days later, or they keep checking on it several days, it's on its back, and finally they go in there, they flip the spider over, and the spider just walks away. I've heard a few instances of that, and please let me know if that's happened to you, because 
it is a curious thing. Like what I think with the avicularia, sometimes when they get close to molting, they lose their ability to grip the glass really well. So sometimes they fall, they end up on their back and somehow they can't right themselves. There's been other cases where I think the spider has fallen and been weakened. I had one where the spider was obviously dehydrated and it had been climbing and it flipped over and fell and didn't have the strength to pull itself up. And it was a situation where the person took it, put it in an ICU, dripped some water in its mouth when in a day or two it was back up to itself. So that's, if it's been several days, your spider is probably, at that point, you might want to try turning it over to see just in case it had flipped over. The other cases, I've sadly had situations where people have gone, hey, it's been three days, my spider hasn't moved, I think it's molting, but it's starting to smell like something's decomposing. If you smell rot and your spider's the only thing in there, there's no hidden prey items, the spider is probably dead. So I hate to go that route, but that's the only, that doesn't happen very often. But over the years, I have heard of situations where the spider is flipped over and somebody flips it back over after several days and it runs away. And the ones where it's flipped over, tried to molt, something went wrong, couldn't molt, and the spider dies in that situation. But normally, 99% of the time, it's molt behavior, perfectly fine, nothing to be afraid of. The next one is one that I get every once in a while. And essentially, it's somebody that's new to the hobby that has done their research and they have read that so and so species, such and such species, will go Grandma Stole Poker Bees. Grandma Stole Poker Bees, super handleable, easygoing, super nice spiders. They get the spider, they do what a lot of new keepers want to do. They decide they want to hold it. And the spider is kicking hairs, it's running around, maybe a, a threat pose, fangs bared. We're talking about beginner species acting ornery or defensive, or usually what they tell me is their beginner species is very aggressive. And this freaks people out because they, a lot of them immediately think they are doing something wrong. I don't get it. All I've read is these guys, it was on your list, Tom. You had your list of your top 13 best beginner species chosen by keepers. I don't understand. What am I doing wrong? Why is mine like this? Is there something wrong with it? Well, the good news is there is nothing wrong with your spider. If I think that's, let's start there. The bad news is if you're scared of spiders, this could be concerning. So it's kind of a good news, bad news deal. Good news is you probably haven't set up correctly. Bad news is whatever the situation may be, it might be younger specimens tend to, we never discuss this when we talk about beginner species. Younger specimens can be crazy. I've, I have two right now, Brocky Palma Smithy juveniles that kick hair with the slightest disturbance. They bolt around. They are not laid back spiders. My other, my Brocky Palma Hamorii, when I first got her, same thing. She's calming down now. She's a little skittish, but not as bad as she w was. That needs to be addressed. Slings and juveniles are usually a lot more high strung. So that could be one of the things there. If you have a sling or juvenile on one of these species and it's acting a little crazy, yep, that's normal, totally normal behavior. All it knows is this big thing is coming down and reaching for it. In the wild, that would be probably about to get eaten by a bird or something else, a reptile. They're scared. That's their reaction. So that's totally normal. So I get that it can be off-putting. You've had it in your head. You're going to get the spider. You're going to hold it. You're going to show your friends. Just wait it out. A lot of times, and I say this, I try to say this in just about every video, temperament may vary from specimen to specimen. What that means is I may have three G poker bees that are the most laid back, cutest, handleable tarantulas you've ever seen. A buddy of mine may have three that are absolute demons. It depends on the spiders. They all kind of have their own personalities and behavior. So is there anything to worry about? In the grand scheme of things, no, your spider's not broken. It's just his personality, even if it doesn't grow out of it. Could it be stressful for you as a keeper because you're kind of scared of spiders as your first spider and you didn't get the little furry eight-legged teddy bear you thought you were going to get? Absolutely. I totally get that. But it is not anything to be concerned with. So I really don't see, I, I have yet to see a situation where somebody said, hey, my G poker piece is super ornery. Can you take a look at my enclosure and tell me if there's something I'm doing wrong? I've yet to answer that with an affirmative. Yes, you've screwed up. It's always, yeah, your, your enclosure looks fine. You're just, your spider just is not in the mood to be handled or your spider is just a little skittish now. Give them time. They often grow out of it, especially when those species reach adulthood. Now, the next one on the list it didn't, when I was putting things together, I had an email that actually addressed this. And I'm like, oh, wow, now that I think about it, I have received many of those. I get a lot from people talking about their spiders eating their molts. Now, let's get it out of the way right off the bat. 
They're not eating the molts. It looks like eating. It's kind of the same way they feed. But what they do is when a spider molts, they pump fluid between the old exoskeleton and the new exoskeleton so they can slip out. It's like lubricant. And then what ends up happening, if you've ever seen one of those molts right after they molt, there is a lot of fluid on that. And the spider is left drained and probably a bit dehydrated. It just lost a lot of its fluid. So what they do, a lot of them will take that molt, especially that abdominal section that we really want for sexing, and they basically suck all the moisture out of it. So they're not so much eating the molt. It, it, they're not grinding up, eating anything. They're not dissolving. They're taking that excess moisture out of it. Very normal, good behavior. I like to see them when they're doing that because I know they're recouping some of that lost moisture. In fact, a little trick I like to use sometimes if one of them molts, and I notice it is just molted and it's starting to gather up its exoskeleton, I will take a pipette, get some water in it, and I will basically squirt some extra water on that. So as it's basically absorbing that extra water on its old exoskeleton, it's getting some of that extra moisture I'm giving it. So it gets a little extra drink in there. But that is totally 100% normal. Now what happens is people see this and they immediately suspect there's something wrong with their spider. Why is it eating its mold? Am I not feeding it enough? Is there something wrong? No, none of those. I, I, people really freak out because they're like, uh, the other thing is they think that the molt is going to hurt them. They're going to consume it and get impacted or something in that of that nature. Not true. They're totally normal behavior. Something, again, I like to see after molts. I, I love it, except if I'm trying to sex it. Then it's like, oh, no, 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 no. That's one of the reasons why I caution people against immediately pulling molts out. I know we love to take our molts. We want to sex our females. I know we all worry about what it happens quite a bit. They go over, they scrunch up the molts. They always rip up that abdominal area so you can't even find any lady or man part, anything. I totally get it, but consuming that extra moisture in that molt is an essential part in many cases of that molting process, and you're basically denying them that ability to recoup that moisture. So that's putting the tarantula essentially in a dangerous position. So And, and it drives me nuts because I see these sometimes with people like plucking this the, the molt out, and it's obviously all wet. It's like, what are you doing? Leave the thing in that you're bothering. A, you're disturbing a tarantula that just molted, and B, you're denying it the ability to go recoup that moisture. So leave them alone when they're, quote unquote, eating their molt. Totally normal. Good thing. You want to see it. Try the trick if you want with the pipette. You want to be very careful with it. You don't want to disturb the spider, but just dribble a little bit extra moisture on that thing when they're eating it. Nice way to give them a little extra, you know, a little more of a drink after the molt. And let's not go ripping those molts out of there when they're wet, because that really, I, I, again, I get people don't want them ripped up, but it's not good for the spider. The next one is one that kind of makes me giggle, but I think we've all been there before. I know I have, and I'll share a little anecdote with the queen, my G. Porteri, the first tarantula I had that I had for quite some time. There was once a week-long stretch where I used to go in, it was during when I was at work, I'd get ready for work in the morning, I'd go in my tarantula where my clothes were in there, and I'd get dressed, and she'd be in the same exact spot. She stayed in the same exact spot for a week. And when I say same exact spot, it was to the point where I took a picture of her one day, and a few days later took a picture of her again, compared it, she did not move, to the point where I actually opened the enclosure and kind of blew a little bit to see if she moved, and I'd watch her just kind of gently move away from where I was blowing, tarantulas not moving tend to freak people out. I think part of the problem is that people are used to more active animals. You know, name a furry animal out there. They need exercise. They move around. Hamsters, gerbils, rabbits, whatever it may be, ferrets. Name a furry animal. They're moving. They need exercise. It's not the same with tarantulas. Tarantulas are very much, for the most part, ambush predators. They have to, they're masters at conserving their energy. It behooves them not to move as much because if they're moving around a lot, they're wasting energy. It means more they have to eat. So if they sit still, wait for something to go by, I will tell you with the queen, she would sit still. She wouldn't move, wouldn't budge. I'd drop a cricket in. Bam, she was all over it. So that is very normal behavior. In fact, we have a phrase that describes tarantulas to do that in the hobby we call them pet rocks a lot of people don't like pet rocks i love pet rocks pet rock basically means a spider that just sits there i've had people sadly that are like ah, i got this six inch b hammer eye and it just sits there and does nothing it's so boring i'll never understand that because if it's just sitting there just admire it that's awesome because some spiders you don't see all that much but a pet rock is basically a tarantula that doesn't move all that often kind of just stays in one spot which i love and surprisingly we have some species that show some of those pet rock tendencies for lack of a better phrase they're kind of surprising i often refer to most of my formictibus species as pet rocks i walk around this room now they're all just sitting there they do it all the time they just sit there i think that's why i end up every once in a while getting the threat pose because they go into that kind of standby mode 
mode where they're just, I, I take their enclosure out, I open them up, they don't budge, I drop a cricket in, all of a sudden they're startled awake, the threat posture goes up, and then a minute later they feel like goofy about it, like, oh, I'm such an idiot, and they go and they grab the cricket and they eat. I don't think they really have that thought process, but it's what it seems like. So a lot of species of tarantulas. I look in my room right now, I'm turning over to my left where all my spiders are, and a lot of them have just been, are just sitting there and have been just sitting there for days. So if your spider is not moving, not a big deal, is there a point where you should be concerned? Well, not to be gross, and but sadly, I have experienced this myself. I've had other people experience this, and it's always sad. You see your spider, it's not moving. You see your spider, you know, a few days later, still not moving, totally normal. You look at it again, it's not moving. The abdomen starts shrinking, You're like literally looking like a deflated balloon. That's probably not a good situation. That may be a dead spider. And I've received many, 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 sadly, pictures over the years of people that they everybody thinks they automatically go into the death curl when they die. That's not always the case. A lot of them will die and not go into the death curl. And in that case, they look like they're just sitting there. The other thing, and I've had this before too, and this is when I've experienced it, your spider's sitting there, you open the enclosure and it you smell that decayed smell and you don't find a prey item. You know there's no prey item in there. If the spider smells like it's rotting, it's most likely dead. So that's, unfortunately, by that point, it's too late and there's probably nothing you could have done in the first place. But the depleted abdomen, the, the deflated abdomen, excuse me, and the odor of death and the spider not moving. And when you, you know, sometimes I tell people just touch it with a brush. You can spray at its feet with a spray bottle. If it's not moving, that's not a good sign. But normally, a lot of spiders just sit there. And I think at first, that can freak people out because they're used to more active animals. You just got to remember the fact they are trying to conserve their energy because that's why they can live so long. They don't they don't have the super high metabolisms. They don't eat often, but they also don't expel a lot of energy with the exception of mature males that are always wandering around. The females, they do a lot of just sitting there. So I think we are on our ninth situation that freaks us out, that panics us, that may be completely normal. And I'm kind of going to combine the next two together because they're they're very similar. We'll kick it off with fossorial species who aren't burrowing. I get a lot of folks that get stressed out because they've picked up, I don't know, a Kilobrachy species, a P. murinus, a Harpactera species, an Acemani, and all they've read is that these are burrowing species. I get a lot with the Acemani because mine burrows. I also think that mine was a wild-caught specimen, most likely, so it kept those burrowing tendencies. I, I, I have a theory that wild-caught Acemani's continue to burrow while captive-bred ones might lose that behavior. But anyway, you've picked up a spider. You've read that it's a fossorial burrowing species. You've set up what you think is a good enclosure for it. You've given it plenty of substrate, moist substrate if needed. It's got hides. It might have multiple hides or at least a hide with a starter burrow underneath, the water, the whole nine yards. And the spider, you put it in there. It's been eating fine. It doesn't seem to be stressed. It's probably doing some webbing, but it's not burrowing. That's probably not necessarily a bad situation. It's not necessarily something to worry about. Remember, all spiders have different personalities, for lack of a better term. And there are cases where spiders don't burrow. I have Harpactera species. I had a couple that burrowed. I had a couple that didn't do any burrowing at all. In the wild, they're supposedly fossorial species. P. murinus, you hear a lot out there. Make sure you give them enough substrate to burrow in. I have a couple that burrowed. I have some that sat right on the top and web. The one thing I will say is that with the old world species, generally what you see is if you have a fossorial species that doesn't burrow, it's going to web instead, which is why when I talk to people about how to set up these species, I say give them enough substrate to dig in, but also give them enough surface area above the ground so that if they do web, they have room and they're not webbing the top close. Normal behavior. What you want to look for is does the spider seem relaxed? If the spider has not burrowed, there's no webbing. It's sitting out in the open. You open the enclosure. It's throwing down threat postures. It's bolting around. Yes, that's not a good situation. That's a spider that hasn't settled in. That's when you should be concerned. But... If your spider didn't burrow, but it's done a lot of webbing, made itself a nice little web hide, it sits in the hide, it's, when you open the enclosure, it goes into the hide, it's eating well, it's molding, not anything to worry about. And to piggyback on this one, because it kind of falls in the same realm, I get a lot of folks, usually with Aviculari carabina species, GBBs, I've had it with some of the old world tarantulas. They've picked up a species that they've heard is a prolific webber. They are expecting to see all the copious amounts of webbing in the enclosure and they're getting nothing. Again, this is not necessarily an indication that something is wrong. 
A, I think some people get it in their heads that when we say they're prolific webbers, that they're going to put a spider in an enclosure and the next day they're going to come in and it's going to be filled with webbing. I received an email last week where somebody had a GBB and they said, I'm really concerned there's no webbing. And I asked how long they had it for. It was two weeks. They sent me the picture. And if you look closely, you can see where it's starting to web around a certain area under some foliage and hide they gave it. But it takes a while for that webbing to accumulate to the point where you see those thick white curtains of webbing all over everything. So, A, there's kind of a two-part here. A, be sure that your spider isn't actually webbing. It's just taking time to web. It can take them a while to create those webs, especially avicularia species. The ones that web, it takes a while before you start seeing that heavily webbed area. Now, other ones, they aren't going to web. I have a Caribbean versicolor now that has done very, very little webbing. Her mother webbed the snot out of every enclosure she's been in. This one's just got a little bit of webbing. She seems to be fine. She's eating. She's got a little hide in a cork bark. Doesn't seem to be stressed. If they're not stressed out in the corner, hiding, if they're eating well, if they don't, I, I have seen situations, a lot of times with GBBs where people put them in and they assume they're just going to web everything up, but they haven't given them anchor points. They need places to start. They like to have little places they can hide, whether it be some vegetation, a little cork bark hide, someplace they can start their home base and start webbing from there. And in those situations, you can usually tell there is a problem. Again, when do you, when do you get concerned? When you've got that GBB or that heavily webbing species that hasn't done any webbing and it's still scrunched up in a stress pose in a corner and it isn't eating well, that's something to worry about. A lot of times, sometimes you're going to get the burrowers that don't necessarily burrow. They web instead. Sometimes you're going to get the supposed heavy webbing species that aren't doing a lot of webbing, but they seem to be comfortable, confident, they're bold, they're eating, they're molting, then not anything to worry about. So remember, again, they're all individuals, and sometimes you get those oddballs that don't do a lot of webbing, they don't do a lot of burrowing, but they can still be just fine as long as they're showing signs that they're settled in and not stressed. If you're seeing the stress, yes, then maybe it's time to reconsider the setup or reconsider that, you know, changing something around in that enclosure to make them feel more secure. Now, although the rest of the list wasn't really a countdown, I didn't go the number 10, the number 11, any of that stuff. I will say that this one is has been number one since I've been doing this. It's always always something that freaks keepers out. I've received even just today an email from somebody that's like, I, I'm a little worried here. I've read this is okay, but what, what's going on here? Let's see how I'm, I'll give everybody a second to guess. Do you have a thought in mind? Do you have an answer? Which, what is the top thing that seems to stress keepers out? Well, if you said tarantulas that are burrowing or closing themselves off in a burrow, I would say you're correct. That is probably the one I get more than anything. Although I will say lately, I've been getting a lot of Facebook messages and messages, uh, emails, messages on my website from people that say, thank you so much for explaining that this is not something to be worried about. My so-and-so species just buried itself and I'm not freaking out because I know it's normal. I love hearing that because it means people are starting to believe it. And full disclosure, I have shared the story many times that when I got my first LP sling, I had read that they burrowed. Thought I was ready for it. Mine was eating, 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 and then suddenly disappeared, buried itself, and I freaked out. Like, I almost went on and posted a question going, is this okay? But then again, I went back to my research, read all the things I had read that said it was fine. Eventually, it came out, tossed out a molt. It was a little bit bigger. Everything's okay. Burrowing is natural behavior. Burrowing is something we generally want from our spiders. It's something that means that they are settled in. Slings, a majority of sling species out there that aren't arboreal, and even some of the arboreal ones, Pisletheria species, Salmopia species, Tapetokinia species, uh, the name of bore, um, Lampropelma, Omothymus, a lot of them start off burrowing as slings. It's normal behavior. I think that one screws people up is when they buy an arboreal species. They've read, this is an arboreal. You got to set up an arboreal enclosure. Give it some height. Give it cork bark, all this stuff. And then the sling immediately goes behind or into the cork bark, digs underneath it and burrows. That freaks people out. Good, normal behavior. That's, I want to see my slings and all my spiders, if they're burrowers, burrowing, webbing up, creating those dens that are going to make them feel safe and secure, that are going to allow them to eat, be comfortable, not be defensive, all good things. But you can't help it. You, It's a weird thing to see the first time. You have your little sling. You absolutely adore it. It's eating great. You're all excited to grow it up. And next thing you look in there and there's no hole. It's filled its burrow up. And you start getting the questions. Can it breathe? Should I dig it up? Should I open the burrow and drop food in? No, leave it. Well, yes, on the breathe. It can breathe, but do not open the burrow up. Do not ever drop food in. I'll explain in a moment what to do if you think your spider is not coming up to eat. That's a safer way of doing it. Not, I would never, ever drop a live prey item into a burrow. That's just asking for trouble because they can 
eat and kill a molting spider. It's defenseless at this point. It, depending on the prey item, a lot of them seek moisture. If you got a nice, as we talked earlier, when they molt, they're moist for a little bit. They go down there. They're attracted to that. They start chewing away. You have a dead spider. So do not dig them up. And I would say the, the thing to ask yourself before your spider burrows, it should help you feel much more comfortable about the process. Before my spider burrowed, was it eating well? If I saw it, was it chubby? If it was chubby, if it was eating well, if you know for a fact your spider's been eating for weeks before it burrowed, totally normal behavior. That's where you sit there and go, oh, yep, it's just doing its thing. That's its way of putting up the do not disturb sign saying, I don't want to be disturbed. Because think about it, in the wild, every time they're out and about, they're exposing themselves to predators. So they have to get out and about sometimes. They have to get out of their burrows a little bit, grab stuff out of their burrows and eat. But once they're, they've filled up, they're ready to molt, they want to get into those burrows. They want to close it up because it protects them from predators. It protects them from the weather, you know, rain. So they close that whole thing up so they're nice and safe in their little burrows so they can molt in peace and not have to worry about predators or the weather, or any of that kind of stuff. So very natural behavior. But again, I've been there. I get it. It freaks people out. Sometimes they just, and I understand it. Sometimes they just want a reassuring voice to say, hey, yep, been through it. I'm okay. I, I always, if somebody asks me, I'm never like, yeah, you've been on my site. You just told me you've listened to, watched my videos. You told me you've heard me say this, but now you're asking, no, I really do get it. So let's be easy on people when they freak out about that. Just make sure they don't dig them up. Now, is there a point where we should be concerned if they burrow themselves? This doesn't happen often. I want to make this very, very clear, but I have observed it in three different specimens, a P. muticus, a G. pulchra, and an S. hoffmani. There are situations where if you give the sling substrate that is too deep, like you got a little small sling, you give it, and back in the day it would be like, oh, it's phosphorus. If you got a sling, give it seven inches of substrate. That's all fine and dandy, except we have observed that what they will do is some of them will bear, dig all the way down to the bottom and never surface for food. And the thought process behind that is the ones that dig super deep burrows in the wild, for example, the P. muticus, will go down so far that they will actually find prey items in the dirt, burrowing insects that they can eat. S. Hoffmani make big burrows. I've seen it with mine. My girl buried, and I didn't give her, at the time she was about two inches. I gave her about five inches of substrate. She dug it up, filled the entire enclosure, so seven and a half inches with dirt, sat in the bottom. I watched her molt and did not come up. So if you have a situation where the spider was not eating all that well, you dropped the spider in, it was still kind of thin, it burrowed all the way down to the bottom, it hasn't come back up to eat, or a situation where the spider has recently molted, you know it's molted, it's been several weeks and it hasn't resurfaced for food, then it might be time to consider intervening. And by intervening, what I encourage people to do, and this is only after, you know, again, you're absolutely positive it needs to eat. It's thin, it's just molted, hasn't eaten, carefully open up the mouth of the burrow. Uh, usually what I like to do is spray the area down so it's nice and moist, let some water basically percolate down so you're dealing with moist dirt because it packs better. Take the back of a paintbrush, open up a little bit of hole, take a pre-killed prey item and set it at the top of that hole. What will happen is the spider will normally come up, grab that prey item when, it's, when you're not around and eat it. I have had situations with the P. muticus. I did pre-kill and drop them down in the corner. There was a, I basically gave them nine inches of substrate and they were like two inch juveniles. Way too much, apparently. And I opened up a corner so it, it basically I could drop prey them straight down and I could still grab with the tongs if it didn't eat. And in both cases, they, these things hadn't eaten for months. Both cases, they ra went over there, ravenously grabbed up those pre-killed items and I just kept dropping items down and feeding them. So that's, be careful, do not drop live prey in. If you're going to drop... If it's a really deep burrow and you can make a nice little, you know, vertical hole all the way down to it and you want to drop a dead prey item in, that's fine. Just be sure you check on it later on. Like I would assume, I, I would recommend do it at night and then in the morning go in there with long tongs. If it's still there, take it out. Do not leave the rotting prey item in there. But usually I try putting it right on the top because what will happen is they'll go around her and they'll sense that hole's up there. And if they go up to clean it up or to close it back up, then they find the prey item and they eat. But that doesn't happen all that much. Again, I've had hundreds of slings lots of spiders and I've only had it happen with P. muticus quite a few times that was a big problem with my P. muticus keeping I was giving away too much substrate and I've lost a couple P. muticus over the years slings because they burrow down the bottom I figure they're going to come up when they're ready to eat and then they end up starving it was horrible had it happen with a G. pulchra that one surprised me but that one it molted 
It was about an inch and a quarter. It stayed, it had about five inches of substrate or four inches of substrate. It stayed in its den and like a month went by and hadn't come up to eat. It was super skinny. I opened up that burrow, dropped in a pre-killed item. It was all over it. And then my S Hoffmani, same thing. She had molted. She was down there. I opened up the burrow, dropped in a dead prey item. She came right up, grabbed it, ate it. Something to keep an eye on, but mostly 99% of the time, maybe even 99.5% of the time, burrowing, totally natural behavior. So that's my list of what do we have there? 10, 12, 11, whatever of the situations that keepers find themselves in, the, the, the behaviors that they observe in their tarantulas that they think something is wrong, where most of the time there is nothing wrong. Now, I do want to throw one in here just for fun that is one that I hear quite a bit that people think is normal but don't recognize that it could point to some issues. And that is a tarantula hovering around a water dish. I have a lot of people that will hit me up with basically moisture dependent species and they'll go, yeah, about water dishes. I always give my tarantulas water dishes. As a matter of fact, my blah, blah, blah species has been hovering over a water dish for three days. That usually leads me to send back an email. Can you send me a picture of the enclosure? And a lot of times I find out that the enclosure is probably overly dry for that species. If you're tarantula, now there are times where the tarantulas just come up and they just happen like that corner. That's not to say finding a tarantula over a water dish, using a water dish, not a bad thing. But if they're spending all of their time over the water dish, that is usually a spider that is in search of more moisture. That's a clear indication that your spider could use a little more moisture in its tank. You want to moisten down an area And it happens to all of us. I just had this happen with my Crypsodromus species Panama, my black Amelia. Love this spider. I happen to notice it got a little warm up here. I noticed one day she was hanging out her water dish, getting drank. Like, no, thought nothing of it. It was like two days later, she was still over the water dish. I'm like, wait a minute. So I pulled out in her enclosure. I noticed the back end of her, I usually moisten down the lower levels in the back part of her enclosure. They had gotten pretty dry. So I moistened it all back down, come back the next day. She's no longer over the water dish. She's back there. So that can be a sign sometimes, not... Getting the drinks fine, hanging out over that water dish for days at a time is usually a sign that they want it a little more moist. The other thing is, sadly, I've noticed situations where people have had fossorial species that they're keeping correctly. All of a sudden, they're out and about and they're hanging over the water dish. That can sometimes be a sign of them being sick. The thought process is it's t- some type of bacterial infection. We're not sure, but there have been situations where folks that have sick tarantulas that end up hanging out, congregating around the water dish. That can be a symptom that something is wrong. Also, I've seen it with impacted spiders. Impacted spiders will a lot of times spend more time around the water dish. The thought is they're trying to get more of that moisture to release the belt, whatever it may be. They're they're craving that water to try to open things up a bit. So do keep in mind that if you see your spider hovering around a water dish for a, a, lo- a long time, not just grabbing a drink, not just kind of being there for a day or whatever, but spending a lot of time webbing up around it, it's telling you and probably that it needs it a little more moist in that enclosure. So there's one we'll just throw in there. It's the opposite. These are ones that people tend to go, oh, look, he's hanging out in the water dish. That's usually a sign that you want to make an adjustment. So there we have it. There's our list. Hopefully, you know, there was some on there people hadn't thought of before. Hopefully that people have been through all this before. It's a trip down memory lane to kind of remember when you were at that point where this stuff would freak you out. I know I can point to situations, but most of these that I've had, you know, where I, it's caused me stress and anxiety because I thought something was going wrong. I was doing something wrong. If you can think of ones that I didn't hit, please feel free to chime in. Let me know. Drop me an email. Leave a comment. And we'll obviously we can revisit it next podcast if I missed something that was egregious. Fun doing these. I think hopefully, I think with the podcast doing as well as it does, and I get emails, it seems like daily now from people that just found it, that are just getting into the hobby. I love doing these kind of things because hopefully, again, it's all about saving people some stress. And if somebody can listen to this, even if they haven't experienced it yet, and they experience one of these down the line, hopefully it'll cause them to pause and go, wait a minute, I remember them talking about that. Then go back, listen to it, and feel a little bit better. Because that's what it's about, making the hobby as stress-free as possible, taking some of that anxiety out of keeping these new and incredible and unique animals. So that will do it for this one. As always, you find me on thomasbigspiders.com. I just posted a video up on YouTube with my piece of of Fusca Highland, if anybody's interested in that. Very excited to show that one off. Beautiful, beautiful specimen. As always, guys, stay safe, and we'll catch you all next time.